So, hi everybody, it's nice to be here. Um, as Joel was saying, how do we advance this? Just this? All right, oh, forward and back. I give up. Ah, okay. So, that's what Joel was talking about in New York. So we're all pretty fed up with it in the Northeast. It's not just New York. If anybody has contacts in Boston, you know it's worse there than it is in New York. But this, these are views in New York. And uh, I still have snow in my backyard as of Wednesday night when I flew out. So it's a pleasure to be here. I was out in shorts and hiking yesterday. It was wonderful. Um, OK, so the first thing I want you guys to understand is that this is a clinician talking who's about to try to teach you some basic science. So understand you should take everything I have to say with a grain of salt, okay? But what we're gonna attempt to do is um, manage to work our way through these objectives to review the development of the normal um, human gut microbiome and the benefits to the host. We'll try to review some basic terminology and methodology, um, discuss the initial findings that come from uh, the risk cohort that Joel mentioned before. I'll describe that study in detail in a little bit. And if we have some time, we'll try to speculate on the potential causative role played by the microbiome in the development of IBD and how this might affect um, future therapies. So um, as most of you probably have heard, we're fancy carrying cases for the bugs that um, reside within us and uh, that the total number of living organisms and cells associated with those living organisms in our bodies are approximately 10 times the number um, that uh, are human. Um, so this is an important aspect of each of us that has been by and large ignored until the last few decades, and really only in the last decade have we really made some significant advances. Um, so my source of everything medical and scientific when I need to do it is to go to Wikipedia, and the, the relationship now between the gut flora and humans is not merely commensal. Um, but rather a mutualistic symbiotic relationship. That's clearly uh, not a physician speaking. Um, to get some idea of what this translates into, not just in terms of, of the number of cells, but really what does this do, um, this uh, little cartoon sort of summarizes the genetic contribution that comes from the microbiome compared to the genetic contribution that comes from the human uh, genetic makeup. So Dr. Kelson can talk to us all she wants to about um, the genetic variants that lead to this illness, but clearly there are some other genes that we have to pay some attention to. Um, and uh, we're only beginning to scratch the surface in terms of, uh, uh, of the consequences of all of these bugs that uh, reside within us. Um, and, and not to be forgotten is that our microbiome is made up of more than bacteria. There are also viruses, fungi, and archaea, and uh, I'll show you a little bit of data about some of this in a little bit. Um, those types of organisms have hardly been studied at all in the microbiome. So what kinds of benefits do we get from um, carrying around all of these organisms? Well, it's pretty clear that the microbiome is responsible for breaking down complex carbohydrates and polysaccharides. This um, leads to caloric salvage. We don't lose some of the potential nutrients that we might otherwise not be able to digest and absorb because of the bacteria that live within us. Importantly, the bacteria produce uh, short-chain fatty acids, which are important both for immunoregulation and for colonicide health. Uh, vitamins are produced in, in some cases, fairly uh, significant abundance. Uh, generally, we talk about vitamin K, niacin, and pyridoxine. I put B12 in parentheses because, in fact, it's been shown that the uh, gut microbiome makes lots of B12. Unfortunately, it's mostly made in the colon, and so we can't absorb it. Um, but there must be some role. There must be something going on there, so maybe next year or the year after we'll know a little bit more about that. Um, uh, the microbiome helps protect us against pathogens. It supports detoxification, both, uh, both of drugs and xenobiotics, um, modulates the nervous system, and importantly, helps train the immune system, promoting IgA production, uh, leading to the increased production of anti-inflammatory and the decreased production of pro-inflammatory cytokines, and induce, induces regulatory T cells. So this cartoon just um, describes the interactions that come from uh, four um, well-characterized 
components of the microbiome. The one that may be most important to, that many of us have heard about is F. prausnitzi or Fecalibacterium prausnitzi. Um, and F. prausnitzi is a um, uh, um, anaerobic bacteria that is one of the most abundant bacteria that lives in our gut. Um, and it uh, is one of the primary producers of short-chain fatty acids um, that are derived from um, um, uh, fiber and other uh, complex polysaccharides. Um, the, the, uh, bu um, the butyrate and other short-chain fatty acids that are produced are metabolic fuels for the colonocyte, which is one reason why colitics um, uh, should be fed to some degree so that we don't induce a state of starvation in the colonocyte. But um, just as importantly, F. prausnitzi has been shown to um, um, stimulate uh, the production or the, the maturation of T regulatory cells, which um, can lead to the increased production of IL-10, suppressing um, other um, um, pro-inflammatory mediators. Um, there are other kinds of um, um, mechanisms of action of different bacteria that are outlined in the cartoon the individual steps are not particularly important for us today, but they are very important in terms of um, the immunoregulation that's going on um, at the level of the, um, uh, the gut lumen. Now, um, as uh, Judith just described to us, the microbiome is something that evolves as we age. Um, and this is a very interesting um, uh, depiction of an N of 1 study. So any of you uh, new moms and dads, or about to be new moms and dads, can repeat this study by making some use of the dirty diapers that you're going to have to deal with. Um, but, it, but what this represents are uh, microbiome studies that are um, generated from a single infant starting at uh, day zero of life, or day one of life, I think, and progressing through the various changes um, um, that happen to all of um, our children. Um, so what you can see is that in the first few um, months of life that uh, the um, microbiome of the infant is actually pretty simple. Um, and uh, as we start to introduce um, foods or uh, the child gets a fever, has an infection, or we treat the child with antibiotics, that there's a progressive change in the uh, constituents of the uh, fecal flora that um, eventually becomes more and more adult-like. And um, uh, this sort of summarizes that in somewhat more detail, that early in infancy and childhood, um, there is um, uh, not the richness of the, of the fecal flora is actually quite low, meaning that there, there, there are not that many different types of organisms. Um, and the stability of that, uh, um, of that population of organisms is also not very great small perturbations in diet or in health can lead to significant changes in the um, bacterial composition of um, the fecal flora. As we get older, the uh, richness um, expands and the stability improves and, until we get to be old and decrepit, like Dr. Rosh has suggested I've reached finally, um, in which I get to be more and more baby-like, so somebody get me the pampers. Um, uh, people have, have tried to study the, the uh, fecal flora and try to understand um, uh, whether uh, it's, um, if it's affected by uh, where you live in the world or your gender um, or your age. And, and in fact, while there are clear-cut differences, in many respects, there are two or three um, profiles of gut bacteria that seem to be quite prevalent that are... Um, um, independent of many of those factors. And so there is a, um, uh, a what is called an enerotype that, um, in which Bacteroides species seem to predominate, and another one in which uh, Prevotella seems to predominate. Those are the two primary ones. More, more recent data has, ha have shown, though, that, in fact, there's a whole spectrum that goes from one enerotype to another. Um, and that, that spectrum, at least to some degree, may be um, a function of our diets. And so this Bacteroides enerotype seems to be associated with animal protein and saturated fats in the diet, suggesting a meat consumption um, uh, uh, like we have in, in the typical Western diet, whereas the Prevotella enerotype is associated more with carbohydrates, simple sugars, uh, more an agrarian type of diet. So um, we know that the microbiome 
can um, change very rapidly within a day or two of changing your diet. Um, the microbiome will start to show some shifts, but after a little while, if you go back to your original diet, the microbiome goes right back with it. But some of these changes, may, some of these enterotypes may very well represent long-term um, effects of diet. Um, and so you have to remember when you go out to dinner tonight, you're not just feeding yourself, you're feeding your gut microbes. Okay, so a little bit about terminology and methodology. So um, to go back to when I went to medical school, they were just inventing this, um, this scientific classification. Linnaeus, I think, was in my class. Um, um, but I'm, I'm, I'm throwing this up in part to remind everyone that as clinicians, we're used to dealing with species. So when we talk about bacteria, we're talking about strep pneumonia or something like that. We're talking about a very specific class uh, classification of bugs. But most of the work that's been done in the microbiome cannot get to that level of, of classification in large measure because the majority of, of uh, organisms that live in the gut microbiome are not culturable. And so the advances that have been made in understanding the microbiome have been made um, as um, um, techniques that don't require culturing um, the organisms um, um, have been invented. So there are basically, at the moment, two um, general methodologies that seem to be most prevalent in most of the papers that, uh, that either you want to read or you're going to be forced to read to try to understand um, this, this um, um, uh, aspect of our health. Um, and the most common to date has been um, to look at the um, 16S RNA gene that is present in virtually all of the um, bacterial organisms that live in the gut. Um, um, and what this allows um, our uh, basic science colleagues to do is not sequence the entire genome of every organism that's in there. That's an impossible project. And so what has been identified is that the 16S RNA gene um, is not present in humans, is present in bacteria. Um, it's highly conserved, but there are important hypervariable regions that um, distinguish one type of organism to another type of organism. Um, and um, these assays can be done in an automated way. I'm told they're quite quick. Um, and what they do is characterize, um, based on amplifying and sequencing um, this um, specific gene, characterize um, um, groups of sequences that can then be kind of binned together. And these bins are called OTUs, or operational taxonomic units. And there are now databases that have um, allowed us to do these assays and go to the database and roughly uh, judge what now it might be called the phylotype of the types of organisms that are in there. And based on the frequency and the proportion of the different OTUs that are found in a particular sample, um, you can get a rough estimate of the, um, of the types of organisms and families of organisms that exist. Now. Um, the other approach is called shotgun, shotgun metagenomic analysis, um, and this is also culture independent. It um, allows um, a somewhat um, deeper investigation of the uh, genetic sequences that are available um, from uh, a random um, collection of the community DNA that's present in a fecal sample. Um, and um, what this does is it allows two things. It can be grouped into roughly the same kind of OTUs that the um, 16S uh, methodology uses. But it also, by giving you data on specific genes, allows um, some estimate of the genetic contribution that's coming from the community of bacteria. So that recognize that, that there are many of the genetic properties of, of these organisms are redundant between species. And so you might have a um, sample in which um, uh, one particular species of organism may be very suppressed, but the genetic contribution of that community for that particular um, uh, genetic uh, um, uh, outcome is, is maintained. Um, and so we're beginning to be able to dig around, not just to um, have a rough idea of what kinds of organisms are there, but what they may be doing. And I'll show you some data on that in a little while. So we're up to the part about risk. And what do we know from the literature about the microbiome? So um, uh, this is a, an example of um, 
um, data that, has, that w came from a study published a number of years ago looking at a um, small group of um, patients diagnosed with Crohn's disease somewhere into their treatment course where um, stool samples were analyzed by the 16S method and compared to healthy um, controls. Um, what you can see is the y-axis is, uh, is labeled number of OTUs. So this is some estimate of the richness of the population of bacteria that are present in these samples. And what you can see is that the bar for the patients with Crohn's disease is much shorter than the bar for the healthy controls. There are many fewer bacterial groups in the Crohn's disease population compared to the controls. And, um, by using some other um, techniques, they were able to further sequence the types of bacteria. And what you can see is that one class or one family of, of um, um, organisms called the firmicutes are particularly suppressed or decreased, I should say, in the Crohn's disease patients compared to the controls. But the uh, bacteroides um, group in this particular population seems to have been uh, preserved between controls and Crohn's disease patients. Another study with a similar um, uh, type of analysis, um, no describes the column, the column labeled no um, are the group of patients who do not have inflammatory bowel disease. The ones on the yes column do. It's a combination of Crohn's and ulcerative colitis patients, if I remember correctly. And what you see here is that the firmicutes are, again, um, um, significantly lower in the IBD population than the controls. In this case, the proteobacteria are significantly um, increased in the, um, in the IBD patients compared to controls. But those are representative of, of only a handful of other studies that, um, that have been in the literature and as you, as you may have seen from the um, um, reference dates of when they were published. These were all published in 2012 to 2014, so it's not like we're going back decades to find the old literature. So the problem with these studies um, is that they're quite small cohort size. These were studies that were generally all done in um, already established uh, patients with established disease who were on treatments, um, and there was really inconsistent sampling in the uh, data. So um, a number of years ago, a group of us got together to put together the risk cohort. Um, and so for those of you who don't know it, it is a multicenter uh, trial that has been uh, running now for a number of years across North America and Canada. Uh, Subra Kugathasin is the primary investigator, and I want to thank him for lending me some of the slides that you're about to see. Um, um, this study is not specifically directed at the microbiome. It's really designed to uh, evaluate the uh, risk factors associated with the development of complicating disease in newly diagnosed children and adolescents with Crohn's disease. So it's an inception cohort, and at the time of diagnosis, um, these uh, subjects are um, uh, donating uh, biological samples that include blood and include biopsies and, importantly, include stool. Um, we were able between 2008 and 2012 to recruit a total of uh, a little over 1,100 children. Oh, excuse me, a little over 1,100 children with Crohn's disease, about 1,700 total participants. Uh, the other participants either had ulcerative colitis or were actually healthy once their evaluations were complete, but they'd signed consents, and so we had biologic material on them as well. Um, and we hope that we'll be able to follow them for another few years, as long as the funding holds up, um, to um, see which patients develop um, uh, complications and then go back to the biologic samples from the get-go and see if we can identify factors that will allow us to predict the patients who are going to have a bad outcome. Um, for this um, uh, talk, what we're going to focus on are some of the early microbiological assessments that we have um, from these patients at the time of diagnosis. Um, this is a slide that just summarizes uh, what the uh, map already showed you, a, a diverse group of academic centers across the U.S. Uh, and Canada, along with uh, colleagues uh, at the, the Broad Institute, which is the group that primarily did the microbiological assessments that I'm about to show you and that have recently been published. So um, in, uh, oh, I guess about a year ago now, um, uh, our first paper on the microbiome assessment of these patients came out. Um, and um, what 
this study did was take a subgroup of our patients. It turned out to be 447 children who um, had uh, biopsy and fecal samples available from uh, the day of diagnosis prior to the induction of any therapy. And uh, so what we had are um, fecal samples, but also both rectal biopsy samples and terminal ileal biopsy samples, which were uh, mandated by the protocol. Um, this clearly was the largest uh, cohort of really of any kind that's been studied in terms of IBD and, and the microbiome. Uh, and it included children who ranged from age 3 to 17. All were newly diagnosed. All were untreated. Um, and as I described, um, we had uh, both mucosal and fecal samples for them. Um, there was deep sequencing that was able to be done both with uh, 16S RNA and in some cases with the shotgun uh, metagenomics. Um, I love these new science, uh, basic science uh, studies because they now have um, abstracts that are pictures, so I don't even have to read anymore. Um, and that's what this is, is the, um, the summary of the paper, which described that um, with increasing um, disease activity, we saw an increasing amount of dysbiosis, and uh, associated with that, we saw a decreasing amount of microbial complexity, and I'll show you some data on that in a second. Well, I'll show it to you now. Um, um, what these um, bars represent are, are um, um, differences in the IBD population compared to healthy controls among this group of bacteria that are identified in the slide. And these bacteria represent the uh, types, the, the um, uh, uh, groups of bacteria that were significantly increased or significantly decreased compared to controls. So what you see is the top uh, five or six um, were um, uh, increased in amount compared to the IBD patients, and the bottom four or five are um, decreased compared to controls. Um, there are actually three columns, excuse me, three bars per, per, um, uh, per uh, organism, uh, or organism family, I guess is a better way to put it. The uh, lighter blue are from rectal biopsies, so these are um, microbes that are associated with the mucosa in the rectum. The darker bars are the terminal ileum, and then there are some light gray bars, which you can only see in um, a few samples in where the light gray seems to be missing. Um, that's just a reflection of the fact that there was no difference between controls, so that the delta, is, which is what we're depicting here, is just the delta is zero. So what you can see is that there are a number of organism families that are significantly enhanced in the IBD population um, and another group that are, are decreased. And um, uh, to go back to those previous slides that I showed you from the literature before, um, the proteobacteria seem to be increased and the firmicutes appear to be decreased. Um, this groups that data in a somewhat different way. The um, brown organisms towards the top are increased in, in the Crohn's disease population, and the greens are decreased in, the, in that population. And what you can see is in these two scatter plots, the um, uh, y-axis is relative abundance, or, or uh, basically your OTUs, but the um, um, x-axis is the a pediatric Crohn's disease activity index. And what you can see with an increasing PCDAI, so with more disease activity, there are correlations towards increasing numbers of those uh, organisms that are increased, and with increasing um, disease activity, you see an inverse correlation with the ones that are decreased. Or the computer can see it. You ask me, it's hard to judge. Um, what's interesting is that a number of these organisms were associated with certain clinical findings, so that the uh, Villanella organisms were associated with the patients that had, were characterized as having deep ulcerations at the time of, of, um, uh, at time of, the, of initial assessment. And in some cases, we had some six-month data, and the diffusobacterium in Haemophilus, the degree to which these were different from controls, seemed to correlate with PCDI at six months, although that's very soft data. I wouldn't take that one. Um, and, and repeat that to many people. Um, and this looks in a different way. This is looking at 
these organisms in terms of their genetic um, um, activity or their metabolic activity, I guess is a better way to put it. So we've got a group of organisms that um, were increased in Crohn's disease. Those are the ones furthest to your left. And um, most of the others that were decreased in Crohn's disease that are further to your right. Um, the uh, intensity of the, um, each of the individual little rectangles represents um, uh, the degree to which they were um, affected in these populations, and then the, the long list that you can't read probably down the side represent a whole host of different um, metabolic um, activities, including genes that are associated with carbohydrate metabolism, energy metabolism, lipid metabolism. The specifics aren't important. What is important is you're beginning to see that we're being able to characterize um, changes in the metabolic activity of the fecal microbiome, um, or in, in, in fact, in this case, it was more enhanced in the um, mucosal microbiome, but the fact is is that we're beginning to see how these interplay. Um, a different way of looking at the, at, the, um, at the changes that were identified, in some cases, some of these patients had seen antibiotics a number of weeks before they were diagnosed, and in those cases, the dysbiosis seemed to be worse, which is an interesting phenomenon if you, if you think about it, and the same phenomenon, I believe, has been shown to CHOP for dietary interventions. But that certainly in these patients who were treated with antibiotics, their dysbiosis was even worse than the patients who hadn't received dysbiosis. So, you know, when you're ready to prescribe flagell to one of your patients to try to help their Crohn's disease get better, um, uh, good luck. I don't know what it's doing, but it's doing something. Um, so to summarize from risk, um, the microbiota that are found um, um, seem to group into two large categories, a group that are enhanced um, uh, in Crohn's disease and a group that are decreased. The, de the degree of dysbiosis seems to correlate with Crohn's disease activity. Um, the rectal biopsy, I didn't show you this data, but the rectal biopsy was a pretty robust indicator of disease irrespective of Crohn's location. So even if you had ileal um, isolated ileal disease in, um, in these patients, their rectal biopsies reflected much of this dysbiome already. Um, stool was not as good as biopsies to reflect these changes, and antibiotics seemed to make it worse. So which comes first? Um, the inflammation of the dysbiosis. And for that, I dug around the literature to see if I could come up with an answer, and uh, you'll see that I have no clue. Um, um, so um, this study is a hypothesis, but what it's suggesting is that Really, what's coming first, dysbiosis or inflammation, is inflammation. And, and, and the idea here is that there may be a variety of factors that, that cause primary inflammation in the lining of the bowel, and that may be infection, it may be an effective defective barriers, it may be some abnormality of uh, innate immunity. But associated with um, these factors, as inflammation develops in the bowel, you in the bowel wall, in the um, uh, surface uh, along the epithelium, you're getting a change in your oxygen gradient. And this may happen because associated with bleeding, uh, associated with inflammation, you get some bleeding, releasing oxygen and hemoglobin into the, into the uh, epithelial surface. Or uh, what I like better is that there, that there are a release of, of uh, reactive oxygen species that are coming from the oxidative burst associated with the inflammatory process. But that what happens in that circumstance is as the epithelial surface becomes more oxygenated, strict anaerobes aren't able to survive. And so you get a decrease in the anaerobes and increase in facultative, facultative anaerobes, and you get then the consequence of that are the, some of the changes that um, are now described in the uh, microbiologic studies. So it may very well be that, that fixing the microbiome, if you will, isn't really a long-term solution to our patients because if the problem is that these strict anaerobes can't survive on the epithelial surface because there's too much oxygen, giving them a fecal transplant and temporarily giving more anaerobes maybe in the long run isn't gonna make much difference. Speculation. Um, so the other possibility is that it's not inflammation, it's the dysbiosis comes first. And as I summarized earlier in the talk, there are a variety of potential mechanisms um, by which um, organisms um, help regulate the immune function, and if something um, allows that to change, you're going to get changes in the, in the um, 
microbiome. And there are some elegant um, animal studies that support some of this. In this particular case, um, this is a study of a mouse model that um, um, the mouse, the affected mouse, has a uh, genetic defect that predisposes it to infection with um, adherent invasive E. coli, which many of you may know are organisms that have been shown to be uh, very commonly found on the surgical specimens derived from patients with Crohn's disease. And um, that if you compare the, I don't have a pointer, but um, I do have a pointer? Oh, how do you like that? Okay, so um, this, this top bar here represents the, the, um, the microbiome of the wild type mouse. And if you look here at the uh, genetically affected mouse, it's different. And this, and you'll have to take my word for it because time's running out, but this difference is very much like what humans have with uh, Crohn's disease. If you take that wild type mouse and you feed him a diet that's got high fat and high sugar, then the wild type mouse has a microbiome that looks an awful lot like the IBD microbiome. And if you do the same thing to the um, genetically affected mouse, then it doesn't change very much. But you're starting to see that there's interaction between diet, between gene, and between the bugs that live in our gut. I gotta do this two-handed. Um, and so in this case, Maybe it's the Western diet that begins to lead to dysbiosis. The dysbiosis then um, pr promotes a little bit of inflammation, which in the susceptible host, in the case of this mouse, it happens to be the enteroadherent E. coli can then attach and uh, break down the barrier further and lead to inflammation. Um, but to go back to the cartoon before about the genetic contributions that come from uh, the organisms that live there, um, we haven't begun to scratch the surface in bacteria, much less in viruses and fungi. Um, here is one study that was just published, actually is ahead of print, um, in which people have looked at the virome, looked at the viral um, uh, uh, particles that are present in the stools, and it turns out both Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis have more viral particles in the stool than to healthy controls, but that the viral particles are different in Crohn's and UC. And there are mouse models that have looked at the role that viruses might play in inducing inflammation. And in fact, we won't go into this in any detail, but there is a mouse model that's related to that one I showed you before, in which um, expose it to a particular virus and nothing much happens, expose it to a different virus and you can get um, a colitis-like disease. Um, it's dependent on having commensal bacteria in, in, the, in that animal in the first place. So raising these my mice in a germ-free environment, you don't see much. But so it may be that specific viral triggers you know, around my neck of the woods, people worry about norovirus and things like that. But it may be that a specific viral trigger is what induces the inflammation that breaks down the barrier that allows the genetic profile to um, um, distinguish itself and that all of that probably is wrapped up with the diet as well. Um, and there's a study from, um, uh, that has looked at the, the fungal biome, if you will, in, uh, in kids with Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. And just take my word for it, it's different than controls. So th this is my final unintelligible slide, which I'm not going to describe. It just summarizes the various um, interactions between gut microbes and the intestinal mucosa that are known in inflammatory bowel disease. And I promise you next year and the year after, this slide will be triply uh, non-interpretable. Um, um, but it it's a fascinating uh, field right now, and it's worth learning. Um, something about it because it's in all, all of our futures. How we treat our patients, how we feed our patients, how we answer the question, isn't there a special diet we should use in Crohn's disease, all is um, gonna be influenced by what we learn from this. Thanks.